welcome to the Mercado Libre earnings conference call for the quarter ended December 31st, 2023. Thank you for joining us. I'm Richard Cathcart, Mercado Libre's Investor Relations Officer. Today, we will share our quarterly highlights on video, after which we will begin our live Q&A session with our CEO, Michael Scalpini, Chief Financial Officer, Martin De Los Santos, FinTech President, Osvaldo Jimenez, and Commerce EVP, Ariel Sharfstein. Before we go on to discuss our results for the fourth quarter of 2023, I remind you that management may make or refer to, and this presentation may contain, forward-looking statements and non-GAAP measures. So please refer to the disclaimer on the screen, which will also be available in our earnings materials on our investor relations website. With that, let's begin with a summary of our results. Hello everyone, I'm delighted to share that Mercado Libre delivered solid results in Q4, marking a strong conclusion to an outstanding year. Overall, 2023 highlighted the strength of our financial model and its future potential, as well as the powerful impact of compounding of several years of investment in technology. For our commerce business, it was a year of accelerated growth and market share gains in most countries. We achieved this by continuing to make improvements in the value proposition to buyers and sellers in our marketplace. I would like to highlight three important initiatives that contributed to our success in commerce. We continue to invest in having the widest product assortment in order to offer the best buying experience to consumers. A key contributor to this was the acceleration of our first party business, particularly in Brazil, where it grew by 81% in 2023. We continue expanding our logistic network with record fulfillment penetration of almost 50%, which provided an improved user experience to our buyers. This resulted in faster shipping and fewer late deliveries, particularly around the Christmas season. Our ads business continues to deliver impressive results, growing revenues at an accelerated pace. During 2023, we onboarded almost 50,000 new advertisers who appreciate the value of promoting their products on our pan regional platform. On the fintech front, Mercado Pago maintained strong momentum as users and merchants continue to adopt our services. In acquiring business, we deliver solid TPP growth and gain market share in most countries where we operate, both in online as well as in-store payments. We made improvements in approval rates and deployed new features that enabled us to move up market, enhancing the value proposition to SMBs. In fintech services, we have expanded our product offering and made improvements to user experience. The increased engagement with our products resulted in Mercado Pago achieving the milestone of surpassing for the first time the 50 million active users in a single quarter. The credit business continues to be an important piece of our fintech strategy, and it delivered another quarter of strong results with accelerated growth and solid spreads as we continue to cautiously manage risks. During Q4, Meli delivered strong financial results. Revenues grew by 42%, accelerating both in fintech as well as commerce due to the strong execution during the peak season and investments we made throughout the year. For the quarter, we delivered 13.4% EBIT margin, excluding one-off expenses from previous years, as explained in the letter to shareholders. This represents margin improvement from Q4 of 2022, while we continue to invest in building a logistic infrastructure, supporting our mail advice loyalty program, as well as expanding our credit card offering. Following our strong financial performance in 2023, it's a good time to reflect on the journey over the past six years. During that time frame, we multiplied our revenues by 10x while achieving significant improvements in profitability, culminating in nearly $2 billion of operating income in 2023. In recent years, we have increased our investment in technology, which enabled us to launch multiple products and services and make significant improvements in user experience. We have grown our development team by more than 10,000 in the last three years alone, and currently have 16,000 engineers who are constantly working to create the best experience for our users. We remain committed to our technology-led strategy in order to continue delivering sustainable results for Meli. We enter 2024 with optimism about our growth opportunities and confidence in our capacity to continue to execute on our strategy. Now, back to Richard to share some product initiatives from 2023. As a technology company with more than 15,000 developers, launching products and features is at the heart of our business as we continue to innovate. 
Innovation is about new products and businesses, but it's also about being attentive to and passionate about detail and solving multiple small customer pain points that compound into a great user experience. 2023 was no different. We've launched several new products and services, such as the Melimize loyalty program, Meli Delivery Day, credit cards for consumers in Mexico and businesses in Brazil, amongst many other things. We've also vastly improved our core products with several new experiences that build onto our value proposition as we continue to strive to offer our users the best experience. Today, we want to share some of this year's highlights. In commerce, we continue to look at the specific needs of each vertical to improve the user experience, as we believe this will drive offline consumption online. In 2023, we considerably improved the navigation in fashion, apparel, and sports with standardized filters across brands and sellers. This enables consumers to find what they need more quickly. On the product pages, users can also see the more like this section to find similar items to a product that the user has clicked on rather than simply going back to the search results. This feature is powered by artificial intelligence. AI-based features are already an integral part of the Melly experience, with many innovations launched in 2023, including a summary of customer reviews on the product pages that concentrates the main feedback from buyers of that product. On beauty product pages, a summary of products, functions, and characteristics is automatically created to facilitate buyers' choices. Push notifications about items left unpurchased in shopping carts are now highly personalized and remind users why they may have chosen to buy a particular product. We have also added an AI feature that helps sellers to respond to questions by preparing answers that sellers can send immediately or edit quickly. To deliver a better experience to our sellers, we launched a new version of the Seller Hub, where they can see all of the promotional campaigns available for them to participate in. A new pricing tool also enables sellers to easily compare prices with competitors and or similar products and receive insights and recommendations on how to boost sales. In 2023, we also relaunched our ads tech stack. An automated buying platform was launched for display ads, accompanied by live reports and unique insight analysis. We enhanced our bidding algorithm for product ads and introduced new placements on search and product pages that give more visibility to sponsored products. Our brand ad solution was also launched as a mid-funnel campaign option to enhance consideration for brands. Our platform also now includes a feature for agencies to be able to manage different brands through the platform. Brands, sellers, and official stores can delegate certain products or even the whole assortment to a specific agency. The agencies are now available to manage all accounts delegated to them in one place. And to expand the possibilities given to advertisers, a new tool of custom audiences was launched and later expanded, enabling advertisers to use filters to create an infinite combination of audiences for their campaigns. Finally, in advertising, Many Play was launched as an ad space streaming platform. Through a revenue share model with studios, we were able to offer free content to our users across the region, enabling us to explore a new revenue stream for ads. In logistics, most of the technological improvements were behind the scenes and were crucial in helping us to maintain costs broadly stable as a percentage of GMV whilst expanding fulfillment penetration. We optimized routes from first to last mile, fulfillment center processes, and demand prediction. On the UX front, buyers are now notified that their package is being delivered and can follow it through their app. And for sellers that adopt fulfillment, an enhanced tool to manage inventory brings more technology to the process, flagging products that need to be replenished, how many units should be sent to us, amongst other things. At Mercado Pago, we continue to innovate as we consolidate our position as one of the region's leading fintechs. In the acquiring business, the launch of the Mercado Pago tap brings a free POS option to merchants by turning their cell phones into a tool to receive payments via NFC technology. We also improved the pairing process of mobile POS devices with merchant cell phones and worked behind the scenes to reduce processing times, which had a positive impact on MPS and helped to improve the experience of merchants and buyers. With more personalization in the Mercado Pago app, our seller homepage now prioritizes the features that merchants most need on a day-to-day -day basis. In fintech services, we continue to search for ways to facilitate financial inclusion. We expanded our credit card offer to Mexico, 
and launched our collateralized credit card solution in Brazil, where the user receives a credit limit equivalent to the value of funds deposited into their account. These products enable consumers to start building a credit score and take advantage of the possibilities that a credit card brings, for many, for the first time ever. Innovations in credit enabled us to attract new users. For merchants, we now offer a business credit card using open finance to contribute to scoring. For consumers in our lower risk cohorts, a new product enables them to offer larger, longer duration loans in our app, personalizing the loan to their needs and expanding the use cases of our credit product. As our product stack expands, we have focused on facilitating and simplifying navigation around all of the different products available on Mercado Pagro. Our digital account homepage combines the most used features, such as transfers, credit limits, investment positions and insurance, adapting to the user's profile. We have seen increased traffic to all of our key digital account products as a result. Digital account users in Brazil can now see a summary of their monthly activity on a personalized report, an enhancement that brings more information to the user about their finances. The report also highlights new offerings that may be useful to the user, such as our certificates of deposit and investment funds, alongside credit products and our remunerated account. All of the innovations offered by Mercado Libre and Mercado Pago continue to have a deep intrinsic impact in Latin America by generating economic and financial inclusion for entrepreneurs and individuals. A recent report in partnership with Euromonitor shows that Mercado Libre is the main source of income for 1.8 million families in the region, and that for 54% of users in the region, Mercado Pago was the first digital payment method available to them. This was just a snapshot of the innovations delivered by our teams in 2023. In 2024, our users can expect even more, because as always at Mercado Libre, the best is yet to come. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, if you'd like to ask a question, please press star 11 on your telephone. Again, to ask a question, please press star 11. One moment for our first question. Our first question comes from the line of Andrew Rubin of Morgan Stanley. Your line is open. Hey, thanks very much for the detail and for the question. Uh, I'd like to dig in a bit on the logistics network. Uh, we see that the net shipping fees and some of the shipping cogs looks like it was a bit more of a drag than in recent quarters. So I was wondering if you could help with uh, what changed sequentially, whether it was more seasonality or if there's been, let's say, sequential changes in investment areas such as shipping campaigns or DC builds in the quarter. Uh, and then perhaps zooming out a bit on the logistics network, how you think about the state of the network, where you are for shipping speeds, shipping fees, uh, and how you think about the intensity of investment in those areas for the year ahead versus 23. Any color there would be very helpful. Thank you. compared to last year, uh, lower delay rates, uh, more fulfillment penetration, particularly in, in Brazil, and more uh, free shipping coming from Melimais, together with uh, a network that has expanded over the year, and particularly in Q3. So going to, to your specific question about uh, margin uh, compression or sequential margin compression, uh, we also experienced uh, some, some cost pressures during Q4 that uh, you will see reverted in early uh, Q1. And, and basically, those headwinds in Q4 come mainly for, for the following uh, reasons. Number one, this is the first quarter in which many mice uh, have been fully operating, and that means that we have increased the level of free shipping uh, offered in Brazil and Mexico as I think we've discussed before many miles is strategic, a strategic and long-term investment that, that we think will continue increasing loyalty and driving incremental orders and GMB. So it's a, it's a conscious investment on, on our part. 
Second, I think the growth of 1P in, in our business, whose GMB was 50% higher Q over Q in dollars, also acts as a headwind, uh, basically because there are no sellers uh, paying for shipping revenues, uh, given that we are the sellers in the case of, of 1P. I think that's uh, going to, to point number three. In previous quarters, we flagged that some of the shipping gains in terms of take rate were due to the negotiated postponement, postponement uh, of cost increases from our suppliers after already having passed through higher prices to sellers at the start of the year, and, and those costs uh, are now hitting our P&L as we were expecting. And uh, on, the, on the fourth, I think Argentina also added some pressure as we decided not to fully pass inflation through uh, to our prices on the spot in an environment with accelerated inflation and a lot of uncertainty in the market. Of course, then you have peak season, which is the biggest component uh, of, of, of the comp sequential compression uh, of, of, of shipping costs. Uh, the, the, there is a uh, ramp up in, in, in capacity as to be able to attend uh, demand coming from our buyers. There is also an increase in unit costs uh, coming uh, from labor hours and, and vans and truck drivers, etc. And, and that is the, the biggest component of the sequential compression, uh, which, which you will see probably reverted uh, in, in early. Uh, Q1 in 2024. Finally, and just to wrap up on this first part of the, question, uh, of the question, it's also important to note that we were expecting most of these uh, increases in cost, and that is one of the reasons why we decided to increase our flat fees, so the, uh, the charge that, that we make to the sellers when they sell uh, items below the free shipping threshold. Uh, if you recall, we increased uh, that be in Brazil uh, in, in approximately in July or August, and with the same in late Q3 in, in Mexico. And this is one of the levers we have used to manage our shipping PNL as well. And it's a good example of how we manage uh, the, the, the profit and loss uh, of, of the company in a consolidated manner and not on a line by line basis. So, to your second uh, part of the, que of the question. I think, uh, as, as we've been saying many times, in the long run, there will be opportunities for us to continue monetizing uh, our logistics network. We are not desperate for that. Uh, we think long term, not only in monetization, but also uh, in remaining competitive in terms of prices to our buyers and to our sellers, and, and we are conscious on how to execute uh, around that opportunity. Very helpful color. Thank you. Thank you. One moment, please. Our next question comes from the line of Irma Scissor of Goldman Sachs. Your line is open. Hi. I hope you can hear me well. Connectivity has been a bit, a bit patchy. Um, I have two very quick questions. Um, Firstly, on Mexico, sequentially, the margin was a little bit lower into the fourth quarter, which uh, is, is obviously to be expected given the seasonality. Um, but 1P, I think, plays less of a role here. So I was wondering if you could just elaborate on the drivers here. I imagine like some of the capacity, logistics capacity ramp up has to do with that. But is there anything else that we should be mindful of? And um, and then on the um, on on a um, on the commerce take rate. Uh, this builds a little bit on the earlier question, but um, we also noticed that there was a sequential decline uh, quarter over quarter, and um, is this just um, basically sort of a, a reflection of, and I'm excluding one P here, but is that just mostly really ex a reflection of um, of category mix and um, logistics, um, and is there anything else in, at play that we uh, should, um, in, in the revenues and shipping revenue uh, dynamics that you just described, um, that we should be mindful of? Um, Especially as we look into 2024 and think about this line, whether there should be further compression coming into into the commerce tech rate, and maybe sorry if you can also add to that um, the influence at lower funding cost of rates um, that should be positive for the take rate. Um, but I don't think we saw much of an effect if, if I'm not mistaken. So if you could just also squeeze that in, thank you.
Hey, Irma, uh, Ariel here again. So on, on Mexico sequential compression, I, I think you, you, you are spot on with some of your hypotheses and it relates to what I was explaining before. So everything that I just described about uh, operating in peak season with a building capacity before the events and an increase in, in unit cost is actually more complex in Mexico for two reasons. On the one hand, in Mexico during Q4, we opened uh, three fulfillment centers and one cross docking station, big cross docking station. As we've been pointing out over the last few quarters, we have a capacity constraint there that we need to fix. And of course, whenever you open uh, new warehouses such as, as, as these ones, uh, the ramp up process is a bit costly and that's part of what has happened uh, over the quarter. Secondly, uh, our existing warehouses were operating at maximum capacity, and that also puts an extra pressure in terms of uh, productivity uh, for our fulfillment operations. So, in the end, uh, there's nothing that, that we were surprised about. We are managing uh, the, the, the cost and the performance of the network, uh, but, but, but we think we are in good shape for the future, so no comments on, 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 on the second part of, of the question on, on some things that, that you should expect or, or that we should call out there. Irma, it's Martin here. Regarding the funding cost being lower, it, it should benefit you know, the credit business, of course, because it lowers the cost of funding for that operation, so that should improve NEMO, uh, and it also should help us on, the, on both the commerce side as well as the as a fintech side, because it lowers the cost of discounting coupons, so that should result in improvements in Margin. So probably, let me build on that, Martin. Probably you will see more of an impact with regards to uh, on the marketplace where the, the fee we charge for for including installments is is fixed. On the on the fintech side of business, on the acquiring side of business, many times when the funding cost is lower, we end up passing some of those savings to to consumers, and that is not as straightforward in, in the marketplace. Thank you, Irma. Thank you. One moment, please. Our next question comes from the line of Robert Ford of Bank of America. Your line is open. Um, good evening, everybody, and uh, congratulations on the quarter. You know, I, I was curious, how should we think about service transfer pricing and the recurring tax impact on profitability? And, and when it comes to advertising, how should we think about ad penetration rates in 2024? And the receptiveness of the product stack with with larger display advertisers now now that they've had time to really understand the product and, and maybe build their budgets uh, coming into this year. Hi Bob, just a week. I think you're referring to the withholding, the incremental withholding tax that we started booking this quarter, as we explained on the on the shareholders letter. I think if you, obviously it's a big charge, and this is the reason why we excluded from the results, to explain results, because it generated a big distortion in Q4 results. Just to put in perspective, the full charge of roughly $350 million, only 6% of that corresponds to this particular quarter. The way to look at that is by roughly, I would say 20 million incremental cost per quarter will result for this incremental tax that we're gonna be starting to to provision from now on. Just a, a, to complement that, keep in mind that the $350 million one-off charge were fully funded because throughout the last 10 years, we're funding a judiciary account with those, those, those amounts. So if in the event that we lose this case, we, you know, we will continue disputing it, in the event that we lose it, it will not have a material um, cash impact on our results. So in summary, I think it's it's about $20 million per quarter, the impact going forward. Thank you. Bob, this is Ariel. Uh, so going back to your question on, on advertising, I think I start by saying that we are extremely pleased with the ads results from, from the quarter. Our revenues grew 72% year over year on an FX neutral basis. Uh, it's the seventh consecutive quarter going above 70%, and that's driven mainly uh, by Brazil and Mexico. I think as, as we mentioned in our shareholder letter, we added 
53,000 new advertisers this year, and, and this is a great achievement and, and shows how strong uh, the level of interest in our product uh, it is today, and, and we expect, expect to build on that in the coming quarters. Uh, on, on, on sequential uh, penetration, I think uh, while ads uh, continue to grow at a very uh, fast pace, GMB accelerated at an even faster pace uh, this quarter, and it is the case that ad uh, revenue does not necessarily follow one-to-one -one the growth pattern of, of our GMB. Uh, particularly during Q4, our GMB accelerated uh, from 59% uh, growth in Q3 to 79 uh, in, in Q4, and, and it's worth maybe highlighting the case of Argentina, which represents 20% of our GMB, but only around 10% uh, percent of our ad revenue. And, and that's the main offender for sequential penetration. In, in such a high inflation context, you know, the lack of stocks uh, in the seller hands disincentivize some of the ads investments, and, and simultaneously, uh, uh, advertisers were, were not necessarily updating their investment amounts together with the item prices, and, and for that, we did already deploy uh, some features that automatically update uh, ad budgets uh, whenever they are, uh, th there is an inflationary context in, 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 in item prices. So, as I was saying before, we remain uh, extremely confident in our product stack, and, and we see ample opportunities for growth in the, in the coming uh, years. Regarding display, uh, it's been not so long uh, for our current uh, product format uh, to be live, and, and we are going through the learning curve in terms of go-to-market strategies, as well as the brands are still learning about branding possibilities in, in Mercado Libre. So we believe uh, in the product that, that we have, in the value proposition we are offering uh, with display ads as an awareness tool for one of the largest audiences uh, in, in Latin America, but, but we need to be patient and, and, and we think that we can continue building on the product we have up to gain even more traction and, and, and make a display uh, an even bigger business for Mercado Libre and for our sellers. Oh, very helpful, Ariel. Thank you so much. Thank you. One moment, please. Our next question comes from the line of Kyle Prato of UBS. Your line is open. Pardon me, Hello, Kyle. Good Thank you. Hey, good evening. Thanks for the opportunity. So I have one question on the credit portfolio, please. Uh, I saw your origination was much higher this quarter, and you mentioned that your own credit card is one of the most used uh, in your platform, uh, I think among the, the, the five most used. So I just would like to have a sense about how much of this origination is coming from the credit card and how are you seeing the contribution spe specifically of the credit card in your GMV today? In other words, what's the level of GMV penetration today versus one year ago? And finally, what makes you comfortable with the credit card origination today? Because we are already seeing some spike in short terms in PLs, which is attributed to this product. Thank you. Hi, Kayo. Let me start by the end, and then I'll go back to, to the first questions. With regards to what makes us more comfortable, we first launched credit cards in Brazil three years ago, and we have been iterating the, the, the models we use to score credits. We have done many iterations several every year, and each iteration we do, we get better results. We saw the, the credit situation overall in Brazil worse than a year and a half ago, two years ago, and so we were more cautious. And now, uh, throughout last year, we started feeling more and more comfortable, and we have been in increasing the, the, the amount of origination in Brazil. And also, we launched a credit card in, in Mexico, and we've been, I would say, aggressive in, in rolling it up. When we look at, as we say in the shareholder letters, when we look at total payment volume for a credit card, year over year, it has grown well above 100%. So we have been aggressive with regards to that. Um, in terms of portfolio, there has been a higher origination. Uh, we have not disclosed the origination amount, but we have disclosed the, 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 um, 
the total portfolio, and you can see how the, the, the chunk coming from the, the credit card is growing. It has reached 1.2 billion, which is over nearly 100% uh, growth versus a year ago. And on, and on top of that, um, and, and on top of that, I would say that the, the, the credit card is growing in exactly the way we expect it to grow. We are expanding in the lower segments and also starting to have a little more traction in, in, the, in the higher segments. And the penetration we see in the marketplace is growing in, in Brazil and in Mexico. And most importantly, when we look at the total penetration of credits in the marketplace, which adds our consumer loans and our, our credit card is growing significantly. So it's not that we are cannibalizing consumer loans with a credit card, which has probably a, a, a lower profitability per transaction, but rather that we are adding to that number. Okay, thank you. Can, can you share the level of penetration nowadays uh, in your platform? Uh, it, it, I would say this is, we have not disclosed the, the, the precise level, but we can disclose that this is the largest means of payment we have today in, in, in Mexico. Okay, thank you very much. Credit, I mean, no, not total payments. Of, of all of the credit products available, our own credit and, uh, and credit card is the, the largest one. Thank you. One moment, please. Our next question comes from the line of Maria Infanto. Your line is open. Pardon me, Maria Clara Infanto. Your line is open. Hello, everyone. Good evening. Thanks for taking my question. So I would like to explore the profitability of the 1P operations. In the release, you mentioned that, that you achieved better profitability trends despite the seasonality of the business in the fourth quarter. So can you please, please give us more granularity on how the contribution margin of the business has been evolving lately? Do you feel that the accelerated growth of the category has been allowing you to have better negotiation terms with suppliers? And how do you feel about the growth potential of the channel going forward? How far are we from reaching an optimum profitability level in the division? Thank you. Hi, Marie, thank you for your question. Yeah, we have made significant progress in the 1P business throughout the year, and we feel that we are a much more sustainable footing today than we were maybe a year, ago, a year ago. As you say, we made improvements on margins. We look at our product purchase margin has improved a few percentage points in 2023, and we expect to continue improving that. Um, that gave us confidence to grow our business uh, and we did grow it in Q4 by 60% year on year in dollars and 85% in, 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 in local currency, taking advantage of the, obviously the, the peak season as, that we had on when in Mexico as well as Black Friday. So we are making significant progress. As, as I mentioned, we, one, one way of looking at the, the 1P business is obviously we don't share the actual profit of the business, I can give you some guidance in terms of how we're doing, if you were to look at the 1P business, now it is profitable before, taking, before considering fixed costs and including all variable costs, that is shipping as well as financing. So one way to look at it is the more volume we have, the better we dilute the fixed cost of that business. So we are at a point where we feel that we can scale the business and should start to contribute to lower the deficits that we have in terms of EBIT. Finally, we think we have plenty of room to continue to attach more advertising into that business, uh, and that creates a big opportunity to continue improving profitability of 1P. Ariel here, just to complement uh, Martin. So we continue to think that 1P is strategic in order for us to sustain our competitive position, to gain market share, and more importantly, to satisfy customer demand through better selection and price competitiveness. So, so we continue uh, to be strategic in deciding, in deciding sorry, which categories and products we, we serve with 1P while simultaneously optimizing our consolidated P&L 
So while, while we don't have a specific target regarding 1P penetration for the future, uh, we are uh, encouraged by, by the progress we've made uh, in terms of, of profitability, in terms of supplier relationships and, and operating processes. And the more confident we feel uh, about that, uh, the more confident, uh, the, the more probable it is that, that we could scale in the future. And the bigger uh, we get, the more benefits of scale we will capture, as, as Martin was saying uh, just before. Having said that, there is seasonality in terms of category demand and the role that 1P plays uh, in, in the different categories, particularly consumer electronics was a high demand category during peak season, and, and it's uh, one category where 1P plays an even more strategic role for us. So to wrap up, we have many initiatives in place to continue improving uh, our retail business, both in terms of economics as well as in terms of selection, price management, and, 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 and supplier relationship, and, and we'll continue to work on that. Perfect, very clear, thank you. Thank you, one moment please. Our next question comes from the line of Trevor Young of Barclays, your line is open. Great, thanks. First one, just to build on the earlier question on advertising, can you remind us where we are in terms of penetration on a geographic basis? I think to your earlier comments, advertising may be remaining softer in Argentina and, and perhaps stronger in Mexico and Brazil. Just any numbers to help kind of frame the progression there, particularly as the GMB growth in uh, Argentina is probably optically making that ad penetration look weaker. And then secondly, um, in Argentina, items growth accelerating for the second straight quarter up 22%, I think. Um, how much of that is related to kind of the worsening inflation dynamic in that market and more of that pull forward of consumption versus maybe some improvement in consumer demand? And just appreciate that you don't give any guidance, but at a high level, do you think that degree of unit growth is durable? Thank you. Hey, Trevor, uh, Ariel here. I think we don't uh, disclose uh, specific numbers in terms of penetration by country, but, but we have shared that while the overall uh, ad uh, revenue uh, penetration as percentage of GNB was 1.6% uh, in, in Q4, if you were to exclude Argentina from, from that uh, equation, you would get something like 1.9. So Argentina is definitely a big detractor in terms of measuring uh, ad revenue as percentage of GNB. Yeah, on the successful item, item sold that you mentioned in Argentina, it's just like you said, you know, we saw the first half of the year where items were, were flat year on year, mainly because of the procession that we faced in the first half of 2023. Then as the second half, was, as the government put more money on people's pockets, we, we saw a pickup in volume, both in terms of GMB and items sold, which increased 12% in Q3 and accelerated to 21 in Q4. And that part of that is inflation, it's like a advanced uh, purchases ahead of a you know, expected devaluation towards uh, the end of the year, which eventually happened in December with the new government, uh, and towards the second half of December, we saw a slowdown of those, of those volumes. But that's, mm -hmm. that's correct, your assumption about um, our uh, consumption. Great. Thank you both. Thank you. One moment, please. Our next question comes from the line of George Soros. A city, your line is open. Hi, thank you. Um, yeah, just just one more one question on my end. I just wanted to get. Uh, uh, I'm just trying to try to understand the, the different moving parts for the operating profit margin. Thinking about 2024, uh, I, I think you mentioned that we should see uh, some reversion in terms of the logistics cost pressure right in the first quarter. Uh, and of course, we have you know structural growth, the one P business. Uh, you know, of course. Uh, affected by uh, naturally there's going to be seasonality but on a, on a more on a, on a year we should see an increase in penetration of the one key but just want to try to understand you know different moving parts also taking into consideration that you're growing uh, uh, again your credit uh, portfolio within credit cards which should come with uh, with increase in provisions 
So I know it's it's you know I don't want to uh, see a forward-looking statement, but just trying to understand you know, what should we have in mind for different moving parts for your operating profit margin. Thank you. Thank you, Joel, for your question. Uh, first of all, I'll always discuss uh, margins. Let me clarify that all the numbers that we'll be discussing contemplate um, the adjustment for the $351 million of one-offs. Even the size of it, we, we felt that it was easier to, to explain in taking those th that one-off out and obviously con including the appropriate um, cost corresponding to this particular quarter. I would say that if you look at margins on a year-on-year -year basis, and excluding the one-off that I mentioned before, we improved margins by 270 basis points um, because of expanding the business and, 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 and basically growing the business and diluting our fixed costs, while at the same time we continue to invest behind the many growth opportunities. One of them is credit cards, as you mentioned, but also fulfillment um, and several other things that we're doing at the company. This is something that we plan to continue. We think that we run a business that should scale very nicely in the long term, and we'll continue to focus on managing costs very efficiently, and as we continue to grow the business, we should be able to continue scaling in the long term. Q4, in particular, is a quarter with seasonality in terms of lower margins because of investments that we make in commerce, in particular behind the special events of Black Friday and Web Fin. Furthermore, during Q4, we intensified certain investments, as Ari mentioned before, such as fulfillment, 1P, and free shipping. So if you were to look at the sequential compression of margins, we had roughly four and a half points of compressions in margins, that compression comes mainly from 1P and shipping, which affects our cost of goods sold. In terms of a, our 1P business, two-thirds of the compression comes from the 1P business, 1P business, as Ari mentioned. The revenues of 1P grew from 9% to 12% of total revenues. You can see that in our disclosures. And as you know, 1P has a different margin structure as 3P because almost 100% of the GMB is booked as revenues compared to just the take rate of the 3P business. So although there was pressure on the margin, the incremental negative impact on EBIT due to 1P was only $20 million during the queue. On the other hand, we generated more than $220 million incremental GMB from 1P, which resulted in market share gains of almost 10 percentage points on consumer electronics category, as, as I was mentioning before. The other part of the compression comes from shipping. As Ari mentioned, there is a seasonality factor in shipping during Q4, which comes with higher costs associated with peak season. This happened this quarter, and we expect this trend to revert back to normal in the following quarters. And then finally, investments that we're making, and we have been flagging over the, over the, over the last few quarters to, to the market, investments on, on a value proposition, which includes the launching of more fulfillment centers. We launched three, we implemented three new fulfillment centers this quarter. The increased adoption of many mice, which resulted in higher levels of free shipping. When you put all those together, that explains the compression that you see quarter on quarter. Let me, so let, let me uh, add to that your question regarding the credit portfolio and, and provisions. Throughout this year, we have been able to expand our credit portfolio and furthermore, gain share in, in credit cards, and despite that, we have been able to increase our net interest margin after losses and also decrease uh, NPLs, which have pierced 30 percent for, for the first time in, in quite some time. So, again, we, we don't guide, but we are confident with how the credit business is evolving. Perfect. Thank, thank you so much. Thank you. One moment, please. Our next question comes from the line of Deepak Mathabanan of Wolf Research. Your line is open. Hey, guys. Um, thanks for taking the questions, and I apologize if this was asked already, but uh, one big picture question and then kind of one uh, uh, tactical one. What, what, so if you think about logistics, what are the big initiatives for 2024, maybe with respect to you know, expanding the fulfillment centers or the middle mile and last mile operations? How should we think about the CapEx levels as we kind of progress through the year? And then second one on competition, 
you know, e-commerce players from China have caused pretty significant, um, you know, shifts and moved into the U.S., you know, and it is anticipated in s several LATAM markets. Can you share any color on your thoughts and how you're positioning the business for uh, any sort of like a potential competitive intensity growing? Thanks so much. Hey Deepak, uh, how are you? This is Ariel. So in terms of logistics, I think, I mean, we, we, we don't guide and, and, and you know, we, we, we don't disclose future uh, numbers in terms of performance, et cetera, but, but just to reiterate what I, I said and Martin tried to explain. So most of the sequential compression on logistics was coming from peak season cost, which uh, has been reverting uh, during early Q1. So, so that, that's important. Having said that, we have many, many projects uh, on hand to execute during 2024, none of which we think uh, should drastically change the way uh, we manage our PNL. We will invest in faster deliveries. We will continue investing in slower deliveries simultaneously. We will continue testing more automation and robotics as we have been doing so over the last uh, uh, few years. We will continue working with our technology team. We have thousands of developers fully dedicated to improving the processes and the experience uh, of our customers with logistics and, and the way we operate inside our warehouses and, and docking stations. So all in all, we will focus in, in, in becoming more efficient, in serving our customers better, in improving our delivery uh, promises and, and execution, and, and to support the business of, of, of the marketplace with, with more categories and, and better services. Regarding uh, the Asian uh, competition, uh, I'd say we've seen uh, Timu in particular more present in, in, in Mexico over the last uh, few months. But still, as, as, as you can see from our results, we grew 32% year over year in, in items sold in Mexico. So uh, we are extremely pleased uh, with how we are executing in the countries. All categories in Mexico are showing good year over year GMB growth. Uh, while we see some of the Asian players uh, focused on apparel and home and, 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 and mostly focused on, on low uh, ASP items, we see our, our growth in those segments uh, extremely healthy. So in the end, we are confident that our competitive advantages, uh, particularly in logistics and, and payments, remain strong. Uh, we, we have a unique logistics network. We have a unique uh, buy now, pay later, and credit card offering uh, in, in, in Brazil, in Mexico, etc which we think will, will continue helping us uh, drive our business and, and our market share gains in, in those markets. Uh, so to, to wrap up, uh, in the past several years, we have been successful in competing against Asian players uh, who were executing strategies similar to the ones that current players are executing. So we expect to continue uh, doing so in the future, building on our strengths and, and successfully competing against uh, whoever is operating in each of the markets uh, where, where we are. So, so on your question on CAPEX, obviously we don't guide future expenditures, but this year, 2023, was roughly $500 million invested on CAPEX, which was fully funded with our own cash flow generation. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you. One moment, please. Our next question comes from the line of Marcelo Santos of J.P. Morgan. Your line is open. Party Marcelo Santos, your line is open. Hi, thank you. Sorry for I had a deadline. Uh, thanks for taking my question. My first question is about Nelly Moss. Uh, is Nelly Moss a uh, uh, net negative in terms of P&L? I understand it has recurring benefits and has a lot of uh, loyalty benefits, but when you think about the PNL impact, is it negative now, and should it remain negative in the future? Uh, that's uh, the, the first question. And, and the second question is: Do you also see this seasonal, uh, this peak cost last year, or, or was something that you had stronger this year because you're running at full capacity? Thank you.
Thank you. One moment, please. All right. All right. Thank you for your question. The, uh, the first part of the question was related to, to many mice. Okay, sorry. The many mice, in, we don't look at many mice on, as an individual PNL. We look at this as a way to generate incre incrementality in our, in our marketplace. So you break it down between content. Content is basically cost neutral because we pass on the, the benefits that we get. Uh, basically, the cost that we pay for the content, we pass it on to our consumers. Uh, and then the shipping, obviously, we provide more free shipping, but that generates incremental volume that, that, that then in turn should finance that operation. In the short term, we are investing behind this, this initiative because we're also investing in advertising, but it shouldn't be looked at as an individual uh, P&L and more so as part of a critical part of our strategy for, for commerce. And then regarding the peak season, if we saw a particular peak, a special peak in terms of cost, yeah, probably this quarter, the, the incrementality of cost due to peak season was a little bit higher than we saw last year. Uh, but again, as Ari mentioned, this is something that will revert in, in, in the following quarters. Um, and, and it was expected to have a peak, an incremental cost during peak season. Thank you very much. Thank you. One moment, please. Our next question comes from the line of Sumit Data of New Street Research. Your line is open. Hi there. Yeah, thanks very much for um, for taking the question. Just one at this stage, please. Um, on Argentina uh, and the fintech business, um, as we kind of contemplate entering a, a recessionary environment, in Argentina, how, how should we think about the fintech business? The, um, I mean, the e-commerce business is a bit more kind of logical to me in that sort of environment in terms of thinking about consumer demand, <clears throat> et cetera, units sold. But just on the fintech side, it's not clear to me kind of what the drivers will be exactly under that scenario. So if you could kind of um, help me with that, that would be great. Thanks. I would say... Let me try to, to split the question between the different businesses we have. With regards to acquiring, I would say it's a business that also is very much independent of, of there being a recession or no. Obviously, the, the, the volumes are impacted, but we are growing so much by gaining share, and the impact tends to be, could be smaller. Uh, let, let us not get into what could happen in the future, but... It's a, a business that people still continue to sell and, and, and process payments. So it, what can vary a little bit is, is basically the growth rate, but no more than that. Uh, where we've been more cautious is on the on the on the fintech services side of the business on, on, on issuing credit. We don't have yet a credit card in Argentina, and we have been more cautious throughout the fourth quarter, even before the elections, knowing that there could be an evaluation and there could be increased in NPLs, in, in and, and that's why we were already more cautious towards the, the end of, of, of last year, and most of the volume growth you saw is coming from Mexico and Brazil and not from Argentina. And, and, and then we'll see what happens with the, the other fintech service products. What we're seeing today is an, inc an inflation in, that in Q4 and even today has peaked and is, is higher than it was. And that is a further incentive, and we have seen that for people to bring money from their bank into the Mercado Power account, which is currently remunerating 80% year on year, and it's a huge advantage versus zero at most banks. And so we saw throughout the fourth quarter an increase in, the, in asset under management. You don't see that in total numbers because the evaluation at the, at the end of the year, but in local currency, we grew assets in our account by 6x year over year. So I would say that I'm, 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 I'm comfortable with, with the impact we saw towards the end of last year. We cannot predict what, no, we don't forecast what will happen in, in the future. And if I may complement, the credit business in Argentina continues to have the lowest MPL compared to all other markets, and it continues to be extremely profitable in terms of, of, of NIMA also. Great, thank you. Thank you. One moment, please. Our next question comes on the line of Nia Argawala of HSBC. Your line is open. 
Hi, thank you for taking my question. A quick one. I noticed that the ticket size uh, for your credit card loans across the segments have been uh, coming off. Is this a conscious decision uh, or is this, some, is this a trend based on the demand that you're seeing uh, from your client? And, and any color on the credit uptake in Mexico? What kind of products are working in Mexico? How is the response on the credit card? That would be very helpful. Thank you so much. Let me start with the with the first part of the question and and then yeah, check on the second one. The first one I would say with regards to the credit card loans, they have been falling. It has been totally been a conscious decision. What we have been doing is reaching out to more consumers who who did not have a credit card in the past with uh, micro lines. What we say that it's typically 100 or 200 reais lines, uh, so it's really small lines, and also with what we call warranted cards where we ask people to, to, to deposit 100 or 200 or 300 reais in their account and offered a, a card that is guaranteed by the amount. And so definitely that has been part of our, of our strategy in order to be, for many of these people, the first time they, they, they get a credit card. Uh, and with regards to, you mentioned credit uptake in, in, in Mexico. I would say that basically we have been growing a lot uh, First, the credit card, which is the latest product we, we launched and, and has been a quite successful launch. And when you look at the combined volume we are loaning to consumers, adding the consumer loans to the credit cards, that business has also been growing uh, nicely. Uh, just in terms of the asset quality trends that you are seeing in Mexico. Sorry, could you repeat the question, please? Asset quality trends for your both the consumer lending and the credit card book in Mexico. Is it better than uh, Brazil? Has it been improving uh, or are you cautious there? Thank you. No, it has been remained fairly stable. The, 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 the profitability has, has continued to be good. Thank you so much. Thank you. One moment, please. Our next question comes from the line of Martin Fong of BTIG. Your line is open. Uh, excuse me, did you say uh, Martin Fong? I, I, you cut out there. Um, but thanks for taking my question. Um, uh, two, if I may. So first, um, I, I think maybe you touched on this earlier, but the the <clears throat> the fintech take rate. I think there was some compression there, part of which uh, was uh, related to um, financing costs and. You know, I think in prior quarters, um, you know, we had we had thought that perhaps um, the take rate would fall kind of in step with with, with uh, your funding costs. So, you know, are you seeing some spread compression there? And you know, any any thought about um, you know how you should think about that going forward? And then, second question, just to touch again on the on the cre on the credit portfolio, the um, the consumer loan balance uh, fell a little bit quarter over quarter. So was that was that a function of what you were saying about Argentina and pausing there, or was there some currency issues, or or any kind of um, highlight there? Is, is it is it sort of you're focusing more on credit card, and and maybe the consumer book um, won't have as much growth uh, for the time being? Thanks. Thank you. I would say on the fintech take rates, part part of the impact is larger portion of our, our credit book coming from credit cards, which have uh, the, the portion of those loans that are interest-bearing are lower than in the other kind of loans. That has some impact to that. Also, on the other, on the, on the, on, on, on the other part of the fintech business, when you look at our, our acquiring business, as we move into SMBs, they typically have lower, slightly lower take rate, albeit with, with significantly larger volume. I would say those are two to, to, to impact in, in the, have, have had an impact on the overall take rate. And the second one you mentioned, if I got it right, was the imp if, if there was an impact in the credit portfolio because of the Argentina devaluation, right? Um, if that is, the I was it's sort of a part of the question. I was just noticing the consumer loan kind of fell very very slightly quarter over quarter, um, and I was hypothesizing that perhaps there might be some currency impact, but just 
or is there something else behind that? Yeah, the, the, there was some impact for two reasons. The, the first one is in, in the fourth quarter before the elections, we were more conservative in issuing credit in Argentina, and the second one is more direct, which is the currency devaluation. Since we take the portfolios at the end of the, of the quarter, uh, the, the, the the devaluation happened throughout December, and the for the loans portfolio we're showing in Argentina is, is devalued already. Okay, understood. Thanks so much. Thank you. I'm showing no further questions at this time. I'd like to turn the call back over to Martin DeLosanto, CFO, for any closing remarks. Well, thank you, everybody. As we mentioned, we are super excited with the result of the quarter, and we're closing a great 2023, and we look forward to seeing you we present results of Q1 of 2024. Thank you very much. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, this does conclude today's conference. Thank you all for participating. You may now disconnect. Have a great day.